Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Stephen Gamble and welcome to the Real World Stocks podcast where we talk about general investing principles and investing in individual stocks. Last podcast we talked about investing in bank stocks and our bank investing checklist. This time we're going to apply that to Axos Financial, a major US regional savings and loan. We're going to do that now after we talk a little bit about what Real World Stocks is. Firstly, I'd like to say a little bit about Real World Stocks. Do you need some guidance when buying individual stocks? We provide monthly stock picks with buy and sell email alerts, in-depth research reports on all of our stock picks, full access to our real money model portfolio of all the stock picks that we've recommended, as you can see when we buy and sell them. And we follow three proven strategies, a small cap value, Ben Graham net nets and merger arbitrage. You can find us at www.realworthstocks.com and follow me on at Real World Stocks on Twitter. Now we're going to talk about Axos Financial. So we're going to start with a website that I like to use to look at different companies called quickfs.net. And we'll look up the Axos ticker here so we can see a bit of information about them, which is AX. So here's the QuickFS overview for Axos Financial. Share price is $44.12. Market cap, uh, $2.67 billion. Enterprise value, 777 million, and it's a savings and loan. It's in the thrifts and mortgage finance industry. So I'm going to read the business description for those of us who are listening to the, online to the podcast. So Axos Financial Inc., together with its subsidiaries, provides consumer and business banking products in the United States. It operates through two segments, business, banking business and securities business. The company offers deposits products, including consumer and business checking, demand, savings, time deposit, money market, zero balance, and insured cash sweep accounts. It also provides residential single family, multifamily and commercial mortgage loans, commercial real estate secured loans, commercial and industrial non-real estate, asset backed lines of credit and term loans, automobile loans, fixed rate unsecured loans and other loans such as structure settlements, small business administration consumer loans and securities backed loans. In addition, the company offers ACH origination, wire transfer, commercial check printing, business bill pay and count transfer, remote deposit capture, mobile deposit, lockbox merchant and online payment portal, concierge banking, mobile and text message banking and payment services, as well as debit and credit cards and digital wallets. Further, it provides disclosed clearing services, back office services such as record keeping, trade reporting, accounting, general back office support, securities and margin lending, reorganization assistance and custody of securities, and financing to brokerage customers. The company was formerly known as BOFI Holding Inc., that's Bank of the Internet Holding Inc., and changed its name to Axos Financial Inc. in September 2018. It was incorporated in 1999 and is based in Las Vegas, Nevada. So currently we can see, just looking at the web page here, that a couple of things about the company. The price to earnings ratio is currently 9.6. Uh, price to book is 1.5. And then the 10-year CAGR on the net interest income is 22.6%. So there's been strong growth, uh, probably above the industry average in the net interest income. Gross loans have pretty much matched that at 22.9%. Earning assets grown by about 21.1% and deposits have grown slightly faster than loans at 24.1%. Currently the loan loss ratio to loans the alliances uh, for losses are at 0.6 percent and the net interest margin uh, which is the difference between the interest the bank charges and pays out for the depositors is 4.1 percent so we can see quite strong growth over the last 10 years the first letter in the bank investing checklist acronym balance is b for bargain find banks trading at a discount so let's look at axos financial and see if it's trading at a discount and when I talk about trading a discount, I mean a discount to tangible book value. So we'll open up QuickFS and search for Axos. So the ticker is AX. Here's Axos Financial. So the price to book is uh, 1.5 times. So that's above a lot of other banks 
Typically, banks would trade somewhere between about 0.67, about two-thirds book, to maybe even up to two times book sometimes. And that depends uh, on their return on assets and their return on equity and people's feelings about the prospects for the bank. So 1.5 times is probably above average. So let's look at the key ratios for Axos to see how that compares historically. So if we look down here at valuation metrics, we can see that Axos is traded between a range of uh, 3.1 times down to 1.07 times, and that's in the years 2013 to 2022. So it's not um, trading near its peak. And if we take an average of these, which I did earlier, it's about two times book. So it's trading a little below its historical two times book average. So although it's priced above other banks, it's priced slightly below its long-term average in terms of price to book. So let's go back to our checklist again. The next letter is A for asset quality. We're gonna look at troubled assets and non-performing loans and the asset quality trend. So for this, we're gonna look at the Axos 10K. I'm gonna look at the 2022 10K. So I'm gonna to switch to that now. So here's the 2022 10K for Axos. And the first thing we're gonna look at is the asset type. Uh, the split of the different kinds of assets. So in a bank, of course, an asset is actually a loan. Uh, other businesses, if they, hold, if they have loans, that would be a liability, but for a bank, its assets are the loans that it makes because it's earning interest in those. So we'll go to page nine, which is um, page five in the 2022 10K. So here we can see the loan portfolio composition. We have single family mortgage and warehouse loans. That's uh, mortgages, residential mortgages, 28% uh, in 2022. Uh, multifamily and commercial mortgages, 20%. And then commercial real estate, 33.5%. And commercial industrial and uh, non-real estate loans is 14.2%. Auto and consumer is 4% and others 0.1%. So those are the different type of loans. So we've got roughly a third commercial real estate, and then about 40, about half of the loans are in single family and multifamily. And we can also see that that's changed a bit over the last couple of years. So for example, back in 2020, 44% of loans were single family. That's come down to 28%. And there's been uh, holding steady in multifamily and commercial mortgage, an increase in commercial real estate from 21% to 33%. So some quite significant changes there in the loan mix. Um, so one of the questions we can ask about asset quality is what's the average loan to value? So elsewhere in the 10K, Axos says that their average loan to value for their loans overall is about 57%, which is pretty good. Um, and that's probably because there's been quite a run up in real estate prices over the last 10 years or so. And that's helped that. They also say that their policy is to not lend more than 80% of the residential mortgage, the value of the house. So they won't lend over that. Another way that we can judge asset quality is to look at the credit score of the people they lend to. So Axos say, uh, let's go to page 98, the 10K. Yeah, so here we can see uh, they will not lend on the one to four family loans more than 80% of the lesser the appraised value of the purchase price plus uh, pledged collateral. And they lend for 15 to 30 years. They also say in their 10K that they will not lend since 2020 um, to people who have a credit score less than 700, like a FICO score. You may ask the question, what does that mean in terms of prime, subprime, and so on? So the threshold between less than prime and, and prime is a credit score of 660. And people who have a credit score over 720 are super prime. So they're saying we won't lend to people below 700. So they're kind of in the top third of the prime category and into the super prime as well. So they're not, they're not doing any subprime lending uh, and they are in the top half or the top third of the prime category and also above prime. So we can also look at various ratios for the asset quality. So let's go to page 46.
Okay, so here on this page we can see some of the asset quality ratios. So we have net charge-offs uh, or recoveries to average loans outstanding. So charge-offs are where the bank writes off essentially part of the loan and says we're not going to recover this principal. So this in the last year was 0.02% of loans outstanding, so almost almost zero. And that's been falling from 0.23% in 2020 down to that level, so it's extremely low. We can also see uh, non-performing loans and leases to total loans. So those are loans where people are not paying the interest that they're obliged to pay, uh, but they haven't been written off. So that is 0.83% and it peaked in 2021 at 1.26%. That's the fiscal year 2021, so that had been during the pandemic. So it's fallen a bit since then. And uh, non-performing assets to total assets is about 0.68%. They also have the allowance for credit losses here, 1%, 1.04%. So they've allowed for more losses than their, uh, their, than their non-performing loans, as you can see there. So let's look at um, another page, 120 here. So this page gives us the breakdown of unpaid balance of loans that are more than 30 days past due for different kinds of real estate and it gives you the percentage of gross loans. So the biggest, um, most significant contributor here is single family mortgage and warehouse loans more than 90 days overdue. That's about 63 million, um, which is about half of the total unpaid balance of loans and leases that are more than 30 days past due. And if we scroll down a little bit here, we can see about some geographical information about their loan risk. So they have concentrations of 10% or more in, in geographies for some of their loan categories. So California is 71% of loans in the single family loan category and 68% uh, of loans in the multifamily loan category. And then New York is 40, 41% of loans in the commercial real estate loan category. So those California and New York are key geographies for Axos to follow the market there to see what's happening there because that's where they make a lot of their loans. So one of the things we like to check as well is trouble debt restructuring loans. So let's go to uh, page seven to see that. So trouble debt restructuring loans are loans where the bank has changed the terms of the loan because people are having trouble paying them. So loans have been modified to below market terms either by granting interest rate concessions or by deferring principal or interest payments due to financial difficulty of the customer. And the bank may place those on non-accrual status which means they don't count them towards interest accruing and those don't count them towards their earnings. And so let's look at then another part of the 10K, which shows us what percentage of those loans they are of uh, non-accrual loans. So we can see here that 1.18% um, of the non-accrual loans were considered trouble debt restructurings. So that the non-accrual loans is in itself a very small percentage. And again, a small percentage of that is non-accrual loans. So that's extremely small amounts overall for the trouble debt restructurings. So another thing um, to do with asset quality is how the bank makes judgments about whether or not people are going to pay their loans. And they have a credit loss model or expected credit loss model to do that. So a key audit matter for this bank was changing the way that they did that. They did that in 2020. So let's go have a look at that. So in 2020, they were looking at the three-year average of historical loan losses. Prior to uh, July 1st, 2020, they determined the uh, entire allowance for credit losses by looking at the probable losses existing in the loan portfolio. And they looked at the historic charge-off rates for the previous three fiscal years and applied those to the outstanding loan balances in each pool of type of loans. From that, they created a general reserve amount. There was also some qualitative adjustments by the management for things like changes in economic conditions and so on. 
and changes in credit uh, concentrations and credit loss calculations. But essentially, they were basing the loan allowances on historical rates. So this could be a, an issue um, if, for example, you're in a very good period where there's very low credit losses, um, but you're coming up to a period, say a recession is coming and you expect to have more, then this kind of model wouldn't necessarily pick that up. So therefore, they switched to a new accounting standard um, in 2020 to change the way they did this. So if we go up a little bit to the previous page, um, which is page F14, the 10K, we can see here uh, how they do it. The Alliance for Credit Losses, ACL, is determined um, by using a, so they call it a portfolio model-based approach, utilizing loan level detail. And they, they take into account historical loss experience, but they also take into account current economic conditions and reasonable forecasts. So they use a couple of key things, which are the probability of default or loss, given the, the loss given in default model, the LGD model. And they forecast different economic scenarios from benign to adverse. And then they do this for a period of two years for all the loan segments. And then they transition from this to the previous model of historical loan rate loss rates. So they're kind of taking into account the, the, the losses that they might see given current economic conditions and expected economic conditions in the next couple of years. And then they transition between that to a historical model. So the, the effect of that has been to slightly increase the amount that they were reserving for allowances for loan losses. So we can look at that. So I'm going to go to page 63. So this table on uh, page 63 of the 10K shows their non-performing assets um, by type. And you can see how that varies over time. So total non-performing assets, 0.82% 2020, rising up to peak during the pandemic of 1.26%, and then coming back down to 0.83%. That's the total non-performing loans as percentage of total loans. And we can see that if we look at the figures here, single family residential mortgage and warehouse is the, by far the leading category where they've got reserves for non-performing loans. And interestingly as well, um, most of their loan alliance is on loans secured by real estate, 114 million out of the total 119 million non-performing assets. So that's that's good because a lot of their loans which are not performing are secured on, on real estate rather than unsecured loans. They have very, very little unsecured loans that aren't performing. And that's um, to be expected because a lot of their loans are secured in real estate. So let's look a little bit more at the loan portfolio itself. The next letter on our Bank investing checklist is L for loans, the type and the length analysis. So I'll switch back to the 10K here and go to page five. So as I mentioned before, there's been an increased focus on commercial real estate loans and commercial and industrial non-real estate loans versus residential loans. So residential loans have gone down from 44% uh, down to 28%, where at the same time period, commercial real estate loans have gone up from 21% to 34% uh, over the last three years from 2020 to 2022. And we can also look at how much of the loans are fixed versus floating. Uh, this is on the next page, page six. So we can see here, they've got a table on page six of the 10K where they show the amount of fixed and floating loans. So fixed loans, 1.26 billion, and floating or adjustable rate loans, 10.9 billion. Total loans, 12.1. So this is very interesting because uh, as we know, interest rates have been significantly increasing over the past year or two. So we're now 
at a much higher rate than we have been for the last 10 years or so. So the fact that Axos has got a lot of floating or adjustable rate loans minimizes their interest rate risk because as the interest rates go up, they, their, their interest rates on their loans will go up. And if they have to pay depositors more, that will be offset by increased interest earned on their loans. So they're not very exposed to interest rate risk because of the high proportion of floating adjustable rate loans, probably about 85 to 90%, I would estimate, just looking at these figures. So that's one of the key risks for a bank, interest rate risk, and um, that seems to be okay here. So then I talked a little bit about the geographical concentration before between California and New York making up most of the loans. And the table below, we can really see that. So California, North and South comprises, for example, for total real estate mortgage loans, 45% of loans, New York, 26%. Now, Axos say they operate in, I think, 48 different states, but really most of their loans, um, a good 45 plus uh, 26 is approximately 70% of their loans are made in California and New York, and the, the remaining 25% are other states. The other states uh, are led by Florida, and then New Jersey, Texas, and then uh, all other places are less than 2% of loans. So therefore, looking at this bank, um, we can look at the real estate, uh, outlook for real estate in New York and California. New York, again, particularly focusing commercial real estate, California more on the non-commercial residential real estate. And if we if we are concerned about future price falls there, then that might be a concern. Although the loan to value ratios, as we can see down here, are very good for the loan for the properties the loans are secured on because they're just down all below 60% for commercial real estate. Uh, the weighted average loan to value is 58% and the median loan to value is just 26%. And then for multifamily commercial mortgage, 53%, uh, the weighted average loan to value. Single family mortgage and warehouse, uh, 57%, and total real estate mortgage loans, 56%. So uh, prices could fall significantly in the real estate before the bank would realize any kind of uh, negative equity situation. It would be an extremely high price fall for that to happen. So the loans have been made at a relatively safe loan to value ratio. So let's go back to our checklist again. The next item on the checklist is A for assets and liabilities. This is where we're going to look at the balance sheet. So back to the 10K once more. So let's look at assets. So I've brought up Axos's balance sheet, which is on uh, page F3 of the 10K. So looking at the assets category, here we can look at the, the structure of the assets. Now, in a lot of banks, you might have a pyramid structure where cash is the top of the pyramid. So least uh, amount of cash. And then underneath that, you have securities such as corporate bonds and state or municipal bonds, where they're a greater proportion of the total assets. And then loans would be making up the base of the pyramid or a lot of the total assets. Um, Axos has got more of an hourglass structure where cash is about 1.57 billion. Securities are just um, around about 270 million or so. And then uh, loans are 1.5. 14.1 uh, billion. So there's very, very little securities in Axos. So going into this period of interest rate rises where a lot of corporate bonds declined in value, and that's what caught Silicon Valley Bank out because they had a lot of long dated um, US treasuries, which fell in value as interest rates rose. So Axos really kind of avoided that problem because they were kind of very underweight on securities relative to other banks. And so I think people have people have been happy about that in the market. Um, so they haven't marked down Axos' stock as maybe as much as other banks because of that. So you can see they still maintain a very small amount of securities here. And these are mostly mortgage-backed securities that they hold on their balance sheet. And they're all in the available for sale uh, category pretty much. 262 million in available for sale. So they're not, and that would mean they're marked to their current value on the books. 
rather than held for investment, in which case they're not marked to the current value. So Axos are very safe there in that regard. So let's look at the liabilities. So we'll scroll down a little bit here in the same table. So deposits, we have non-interest bearing deposits, uh, 5 billion, and interest bearing deposits, and 8.9 billion. I'll come on to those a bit more later. Advances from the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, so if banks can't fund themselves fully from their deposits, they can borrow from their local Federal Home Loan Bank, which would be, or San Francisco for this particular bank. These are pretty minimal here, 118 million, which is, which is good. They have uh, 445 million of borrowings and then securities loaned uh, 474 million, but that they have a securities business. So those are mostly canceled out by the securities that they've lent out themselves or that they, they've borrowed rather. And then they have um, some current liabilities as well. So their, their balance sheet is looking pretty healthy. And uh, we have total deposits, 13.9 billion. Uh, total loans, 14.1 billion. So they've pretty much matched their total deposits with their total loans and they have 1.2 billion in cash as well. So uh, elsewhere in the 10K, it talks about the FDIC insurance of their deposits. This has been a big issue recently. People have been worried about banks that had a lot of uninsured deposits. The depositors might move those deposits out of banks. So let's look at Axos to see how much uh, uninsured deposits it has. So they had um, 2.3 billion of uninsured deposits. And that's pretty small compared to a lot of other banks. It's, I think it's about 20%. A lot of other banks are much higher than that. So that's not really a concern. And another thing we can look at on the liability front is the, the interest rate uh, sensitivity of earnings and the effect on equity. So let's look at that. So this said uh, table, which is on page 71 of the 10K, shows how Axos's earnings would change, how the net interest income would change rather, when the bank base rate changes. So you can see if we go up 200 basis points, we get a 9.2% change, a positive change in, in net interest income. And then if it goes down 100 basis points, we get a negative 5% in net interest income. So therefore, we can conclude that as interest rates rise, Axos should benefit its with net interest uh, income. We can also see how their equity changes. So if, for example, if rates go up 300 basis points, their equity would fall from 11.8% as percentage of assets uh, to 11.2%. So, so now we've looked at assets and liabilities. Let's go on to the next letter in our bank investing checklist acronym balance which is n uh, for new management so here we're going to look at the tenure of the management and for this i've pulled up the proxy statement for axos so the proxy statement helpfully gives us the tenure of all of the the bank executives so here in this page which is page uh, nine of the proxy statement we can see the age and the tenure of all the bank's officers. The CEO is Gregory Garabrands. He is age 50 and he's been president and CEO of the bank since October 2007. So he took over really during the great financial crisis. And another other key people are the, the CFO. He was um, aged 40, Derek K. Walsh, and he's been CFO since September 2021. However, before that, he was a senior vice president and chief accounting officer um, from February 2015 to September 2021. And before that, the first vice president of financial reporting. So he's an internal promotion and he's had a lot of experience within the company. Um, other people are Thomas Constantine, the chief credit officer since August 2010. So really what I'm looking for here is to see who was in charge during the great financial crisis and to see then if they're still there and if there's sufficient experience in the bank to navigate a downturn. Because obviously over the last 10 years, we've had very loose credit conditions. We've had uh, very benign economic conditions, but the bank needs to be able to weather a downturn. And so I want to see that the people who are running the bank have got good experience to do that. So I'll just switch to quick FS so we can have a look at the overview um, of the bank. And hopefully we get this chart return on equity. So we're looking 
uh, we can see what happened in the last financial crisis. So we can see that the bank made a positive return on equity all the way through the great financial crisis, dropping to about 4 or 5%, but it didn't make any losses during the last financial crisis, which is helpful. So therefore, I would expect that they would not make losses during any subsequent recession or financial crisis coming up. Because Gregory Garbrandt took over in late 2007 during the teeth of the financial crisis and he managed to steer the bank to a much better return on equity in the recovery and it's held a good return on equity ever since. Let's go back to our bank investing checklist. So the next thing is capital ratios. So we'll check those first, the minimums. This is the amount of equity the bank holds relative to its loan assets. So we're going to go to page 67 to look at the bank's capital ratios. So we see two sets of capital ratios here, company ratios and bank ratios. And that's because the bank is owned by a holding company. So these are slightly different. What we're going to look at is the ones for the bank. And we can see the bank in 2022 had a total risk-based capital ratio of 12.01%. That's versus the minimum to be well capitalized of 10.00%. So uh, the bank is well capitalized and also meets all the other uh, capital ratios in the table as well as being well capitalized. 2% above the regulatory minimum. So it's got about 20% more capital than it's required to have uh, according to the regulatory minimum. So we'll go back to our checklist. So now we're coming to the last letter on our checklist, which is E for earnings. And here we're going to look at non-interest income and expense, interest income and other factors affecting the earnings. It's going to switch back to the 10K once more, and we're going to look at earnings. Now this bank is a little unusual compared to other banks in the respect that it doesn't have any branches. It's an internet-based bank. So Axos Financial was originally called Bank of the Internet Holdings. And so it say here, they make a key statement, because we do not incur the significantly higher fixed operating costs inherent in a branch-based distribution system, and that is things like rent, but probably the biggest single cost is salaries of people to staff those bank branches. The bank is able to rapidly grow our deposits and assets by providing a better value to our customers and by expanding our low-cost distribution channels. So this is very interesting. One of the ways that we can look at the compare one bank to another is their efficiency ratio. That is the percentage of their non-interest expenses as a percentage of their net interest income. So Axos targets an analyzed, annualized efficiency ratio uh, at 40% or lower. So they're saying that we're they're saying that of of the dollars earned for by the, for net interest which is the difference between the interest they charge on the loans and the interest they pay out on deposits, they would only be spending $4 out of every 10 on their ex their expenses, like their branch branches and their overheads and so on. So that's just for, the, that's for their banking uh, segment. They have a security segment as well, which we'll discuss later. So that's quite a good efficiency ratio. Um, a good bank would have efficiency ratio of 50% or lower as a, a rule of thumb. And so it's interesting that Ac Axos has this uh, zero branch model. A lot, many other banks have branches. And so the benefit of that is they'll have a low cost advantage. So money is a commodity. And so if they can have a, a low cost advantage, then they can maybe pay higher interest rates for their depositors and be able to attract depositors more easily than other banks. And or maybe they can have higher net interest margins and improve their earnings. So therefore, that's a kind of structural advantage that they have because of their business model. And we we can see that companies which have a structural cost advantage can be very good investments like companies like Costco and, and Geico, for example. So Geico, um, an insurance company which Warren Buffett owns, directly sells insurance to the end customer uh, over the internet and previously by telephone. So it doesn't employ uh, middlemen or salespeople to, to sell insurance, but directly sells to the end customer. That gives it a, a lower cost advantage. So there's some similarities to that um, model with Axos. So let's look at page 58, which is the securities business in the bank. 
So the bank has a securities business. It's one of its two operating segments. And we can see here that the banking business was quite profitable, making net income before taxes of 328.5 million, whereas the securities business um, had net interest income of 18.7 million and non-interest income as well, 27.6, but non-interest expense of 48. So it made a net loss of 1.7 million. So the, the, the securities business is not really contributing anything to the overall results of the bank. It's not harming them very much, but it's not contributing anything either. So all of the income really comes from the banking business in this bank. So let's go a little bit further down to look at the net interest margin. So here's some key figures for the bank on page 58 of the 10K. So efficiency ratio, as I mentioned, um, this is just for the banking business. It was 42% at the mid 2021. Return on average assets, 1.76%, which is quite good for a bank. Interest rate spread, and then net interest margin, 4.11%. Again, pretty good for a bank. So let's go to page 46 to look at some more metrics for the bank. So this table on um, page 46, the 10K shows a number of different port performance ratios and other information. And again, we can see down at the bottom um, all of the loan alliances. So this is kind of a good summary table looking at the performance of the bank. We can see return on equity has been very good over the last three years, uh, 15 to 16 and a half percent. And the efficiency ratio of the bank overall is 50%. And that's higher than the efficiency ratio of the banking segment only because they have they have this securities business and the overheads of the general bank as well. So I calculated that Axos have about $10.4 million worth of deposits per employee. And they earn about 0.44 million of net interest per employee. They have about 1,335 employees, which is fairly low for a, a bank which has about 14 billion in loans. So let's look at the income statement on page 90. So this income statement is actually on uh, page F4 of the 10K. So here we can see for the years ended 2022, to 2021 and 2020, the, the income. So net interest income has risen from 435 million in 2020 up to 589 million in 2022. And Non-interest income has risen more slowly from 102 to 113 million. And we can see in the non-interest expenses that salaries are the, by far the biggest cost, 167 million. Data processing is the second biggest cost at 50 million. as other various costs down below. So income before income taxes, 339.9 million. Income tax is 99 million, so they're paying about a 30% tax rate, which is fairly high, but that's because I think they operate in California and New York where state taxes are high and they have to pay federal taxes as well. So net income for the bank 2022 is $241 million. That's up from $183 million in 2020. So this is the balance sheet as of the year ended 30th of June 2022. So we can, uh, on the 27th of July 2023, they're due to release their um, their earnings for the for the last quarter of the year uh, that year. So this is almost one year out of date. So we've looked at the 2022 10K of Axos, which has figures ending in the end of June 2022. But since then, of course, they've released multiple 10Qs. So the latest 10Q has been released, it goes up to the end of March, 2023. So now what I'm gonna do is look at that and we're gonna review the key risks of Axos and also give an appraisal of what the thing the company might be worth. Here I've got the fiscal 2023 year, third quarter 10Q of Axos Financial. So we're gonna look firstly at deposit risk. And for that, we're gonna to turn to page one. So I wanted to see how the deposits changed since uh, the 10K, which is mid-2022. So we can see a big change in non-interest bearing deposits. They're down from 5 billion to 3.2. But interest bearing deposits are up from 8.9 to 13.6, more than offsetting the decline in non-interest bearing deposits. 
Axos have very low efficiency ratio. That's the ratio to, from their non-interest expenses as a percentage of their net interest income. And so therefore, they probably are able to pay competitive interest rates to depositors. So that's a, a structural cost advantage they have over other banks in their industry because they don't have branches. They're able to maintain that low efficiency ratio. And therefore, they've been able to attract a lot of interest-bearing deposits. So I think that Axos overall should have no problems attracting deposits. Also, 85% of their deposits are FDIC insured as well. Another key risk in Axos is asset quality, that is the quality of their loans. Recall that most of their loans and their mortgages are from California residential and New York commercial real estate. Those are two key places for Axos. So let's go and look back at the great financial crisis and see how they handled themselves in 2008. So for that, we're going to switch to the 2008 10K and look at that. So I'm going to go to page 27 to look at loan allowances and charge-offs. So this table shows us uh, charge-offs relative to loans outstanding. So it's actually uh, zero for a lot of the years, 2004 to 2007. 2008 was 0.18%. Uh, the allowances for loan losses to total loans held for investment has varied from 2004 to 2008 from 0.3% to 0.43%. So even in the midst of the financial crisis, they had relatively low loan alliances and also very low charge-offs. So they are pretty well run. And so one of the other things we can look, do to look at asset quality is look at their loan to value ratios during the great financial crisis. So we're gonna to go to page seven for that. So here we can see the loan to value table. So they, they break it down by category, but essentially the loan to value ranges from 45 or 46% up to about 59%. Uh, in some categories up to about 62%. So right now, in 2023, Axos's uh, loan-to-value ratio averages 54%, and the weighted average loan-to-value in 2008 was 54.5%, so it's almost identical to what it was in 2008, which shows that in a financial crisis, they've made prudent loans, and they haven't lent a lot against the properties that they're lending mortgages on. And that's why they were able to come through that 2008 financial crisis with relatively unscathed with low loan allowances, low charge-offs. So um, Gregory Garbrandt's the CEO in place 2007 onwards, is still in place at the bank. So that would give me some confidence that in the current market with a similar loan-to-value ratios they have as they had in 2008, they should come through any recession or drop in house prices relatively unscathed in terms of their asset quality. Another thing we can look at is interest rate risk. So for this, we're gonna switch back to the 2023 uh, 10Q. So here we are in page 34 of the 10Q for the third quarter of the fiscal 2023 year. So here we can look at the net interest income. And what I'm looking at here is how for the nine months ending in March 2023, how their net interest income compared to the previous year. So versus the previous year, interest rates were up quite a bit. So in the previous uh, nine month period, and the, the nine months ending March 2022, they made $183 million net, in, net income. Whereas in the nine months ending 2023, they made 200 and $20 million net income. So we can see from that that the increase in interest rates in that period didn't negatively affect their earnings. It um, Their earnings still increased in that period. So now we're going to do an appraisal of Axos and see if we can value the company or determine what kind of percentage annual return we could obtain in the company. So I'm going to do a couple of methods to do that. One is estimating free cash flow plus growth and one is valuing it on a price to book basis. So for free cash flow plus growth first, We'll, we'll switch back to QuickFS so we can look at the figures. Here's the income statement on QuickFS for Axos Financial. So we can see that uh, if we average the last three years' earnings, including the trailing 12 months, we can get uh, to a figure of about $245 million in net earnings. 
And that's that earnings yield of about 9%. That's the earnings uh, divided by the current market cap. And the growth over the last 10 years, the median uh, 10 year CAGR and growth has been 22.6% net, net, net interest income growth. So if we add 9% plus 22%, percent that gives us 31%. And it's important that we look, consider the net earnings because there's quite a significant tax rate in uh, the places that the Axos operate. We'll operate a lot in California and New York. There's a lot of state taxes there. So there's a 30% tax rate. So we're considering the net earnings or earnings after tax there. So you're looking to get about a 30% return if there's no multiple change in the stock. Now, if we assume a conservative scenario where the growth in Axos slows to half of what it is now, that's slowing to 11%, and also earnings are reduced by half due to increased allowances. So um, maybe there's a recession and they have to make increased allowances for their loans. If we assume that allowances are 75% higher, the total allowances, than they are at the moment, that would be adding $123 million to the alliances. That would increase them from 1% to 1.75%. We would still have an earnings yield of 5% at that, at that point, plus the 11% growth giving us a 16% annualized return in the stock, which would beat the market. Another way that we can look at Axos to value it is on a price to book basis. So we can, let's look again at the 2023 10Q. So I'll put it up here. And if we scroll to page 32, we can see at the bottom a table which includes the tangible book value per common share. So for the third quarter ending 2023, that was $28.03. So at the current price of Axos, that works out to a price to book ratio of about 1.57 times, maybe 1.6 times. So let's switch back to QuickFS again. And we're gonna to go to the key ratios in the drop down. So if we scroll to the bottom, we can see price to book. We've got a table here of price to book values for 2013 to 2022. And that's ranged between um, 3.1 uh, down to all the way down to 1.07 times price to book. So currently we're at 1.6 times. So the 10 year, the average of those 10 years would be two times. So they're priced a little bit below their 10 year average. Um, about um, 0.4 times book below that. So there's an opportunity to go up about a quarter to a third if they would normalize their price to book price. So in conclusion, I haven't seen any major red flags in Axos and it seems like interesting opportunity, potential market beating return. And I want to disclose that Railware Stocks has a position on Axos Financial. Uh, this is not investing advice. Uh, please see the full terms and conditions on our website at www.railworthstocks.com. And thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video. And if you have any suggestions for stocks to review or any other questions, please get in touch.